This archived clip from Make Live is brought to you by DigiKey. Join us live every second and fourth Wednesday of the month. So we're going to talk to um, Michael Curry, who designed these awesome turtle shell racers from Maker, uh, the MakerBot Raceway at Maker Fair. Yeah. Raceway, Raceway, Raceway. Raceway, Raceway. Yeah, if you were there, you, you heard that. Raceway, Raceway, Raceway. So Matt and I took a little race together. Yes, let's see that. And, uh, and I, I lost miserably. I'm the pink car here. You can see how I spin out immediately and have really a lot of trouble. But Matt does quite well. Look at him here. It's Ooh, all about maneuverability. Now, there's a, a, a Wii game called, I think it's called Big Brain Academy, where you've got this train tracks and you've got to do it. It was a lot of practicing on Wii with Big Brain Academy that made me win. There I go. Really? There I, I, I had this problem where like you're turning with the wheel and then you're, you're, ste you're steering with the wheel, but the yeah. track goes back and forth. And I'm dyslexic, so like... I got all turned around, but, but there I am, finishing finally. And there's the blue shell. Just like with real Mario Kart, or real Mario Kart, when you're playing Mario Kart on, <laughs> on, on the Wii, the blue shell comes in just as you're finishing, and usually it totally ruins, it totally ruins what you're... Um, well, he didn't, he, totally ruin, he didn't totally ruin me. He, uh, he came in after me, so that's yes. nice. So, Michael, uh, first of all, thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. Thanks for designing such an awesome yeah. <laughs> thing that we experienced at Maker Fair. We had a lot of fun. Everybody seems to really like it, and that makes me happy. You were on the, the, the Turtle Shell Racers were on the Engadget show with us, too. We got, to, we got asked a few questions about them, actually. <laughs> yeah. You the fielded audience. them very well. <laughs> like, like true champion drivers. You knew your machines inside and out. Yes. Yeah. <laughs> well, we had a little bit of practice. So <laughs> what, what was the Maker Fair experience like for you? How did, how did these ha handle at Maker Fair? Um, the turtle shells handled great. What I hadn't anticipated was uh, the amount of love and the driving ability that little New Yorkers bring to a racetrack. I mean, these kids mean trained for <laughs> minutes <laughs> right. in the New York Taxi School of Driving. So there was a lot of kind of sideline repair that had to go on continuously. Oh, really? <laughs> So it, it was it was a tough experience then, or was it? It was rewarding, but there was there were some tense moments okay. when you didn't quite know if that servo screw was going to go in, if the car couldn't get back out there with the pack. So you had, you had a pit crew then, like? Yes, a pit crew of me, myself, and I. <laughs> <laughs> well, I, every time I went by there, there were always turtle shell racers racing around the track, so I never noticed. Now, where did the inspiration come for for doing this, doing a three D version of that? Well, the inspiration from these shells actually doesn't come from where everybody assumes it comes from. It came from the, uh, the Power Wheels Racing Circuit, which is an event that goes on in the Maker Fairs out in the Midwest. Yeah, we had them on, uh, on Maker Fair Detroit for our show then. We, we exactly, and I had, I had rushed to get these done for Maker Fair Detroit because the idea was after seeing the event in Kansas City, I had wondered, like, well, what can make this even more awesome than it already is? Because we've got full-grown adults on super-modified children's power wheels with giant car batteries in them. Right. And the only way I could think to make it better was turtle shells. It's, it's real-life Mario Kart. Mm -hmm. So you made these to... This is, that's when you got the idea to make this and, and put that out there then? Exactly. Well, it was, it was kind of a collaboration over a, quite a bit of time. You know, they, they were working on getting their things done, and I was working on a way to disrupt their race. At the end of the day, I decided not to throw them over the fence at Detroit because I didn't really want to see them get crushed. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I don't blame you. They're very nice. You know, they get hurt pretty easily. We have a few questions already, okay. like how much plastic is involved in this project? There's about a pound of plastic in the shell. It takes about two days on a single machine to print one shell if you're going to print kind of a full working day. So why don't we take this guy apart a little and see what, he, what components he's made of. Maybe we can throw the top of the turtle shell under the close-up camera over to your left there, Michael. Okay. Kind of open the hood here a bit. Here, one of you can wear that as a hat. It works really well for that. There we go. Ah, there we so go. The shell's actually printed in, in those four main pieces there. Right, so the shell, the size of the shell can't tell which way to go yeah, here. Yeah, it's all backwards. It's, it's backwards. Well, it's mirror image. Yeah, my, my cameraman is terrible. <laughs> <laughs> Be careful what you say. <laughs> We're going to meet the cameraman later. <laughs> so as you can see, there's a printed drivetrain. The shell is printed in four main quadrants, which is eight main pieces. Um, that corresponds roughly to the build platform on my old Cupcake CNC. I wanted to be able to get them within that 100 by 100 centimeter square. Sorry, 100 by 100 millimeter square. Centimeter would be amazing. Um, over time, though, as we came here, I kind of tried to make the, the platforms bigger and understand how we can get more space on each one. 
The, uh, the hardest part of the whole thing was the 3D printed drivetrain, which is this gearbox here. So we literally have a inexpensive DC motor driving a set of gears, which are then driving the wheels down in the base of the car. The only thing that's left in the car that comes from the donor car is the tires and pieces of the front steering. Oh, no kidding. Yeah. So how did you, did you know all this RC stuff before you, I mean? No. No, you, no. How, how did you figure out as, uh, yeah. <laughs> you, you, you figured it out as you went then? No, through the help of lots of my friends at the, uh, the Cowtown Computer Congress, which is my hacker space in Kansas City, I essentially stumbled my way into building a remote control car. It's, you know, it's not a hobby I had. There's a lot of people who know a lot more than I do about high-end RC cars or even RC cars in general. And I'm not above asking questions because sure. if you don't ask the questions, you're never going to find out how to do something. Sure, sure. It's true. So what was the, I heard the first version is a little different, right? The original version used was literally just kind of a shell that went on top of a cheap right. remote control car. The problem was I underestimated how cheap the cheap remote control car was. So by the time you had this little $12 car body with a pound of ABS plastic on top of it, and then you turned it on and tried to get it to drive, it just kind of didn't go very well and then burned out. What kind of battery are you using on this one? These shells use um, lithium poly polymer batteries, which was mostly just to allow us to not go through tons and tons of AA batteries at the fair. Mm -hmm. That way we could take them out, recharge them, put them back in. Um, they can run just fine on four or five AA batteries. Wow. Cool. Neat. Oh. Now, what's the strategy when you're designing something bigger? You know, we, we, we talked about designing something small in Tinkercad. What's really the strategy when it comes to designing something that's more complex like this? Well, these were designed entirely in Google SketchUp, and it's really a strategy of essentially having an idea of where you're going, kind of starting with a concept, but then being willing to adapt it as you discover problems. So people always ask, oh, well, did you cut it up before you printed it? Well, no, I didn't. I actually cut it up as I designed it because it was designed to print on the MakerBot. And I wanted it to be printable for anybody who had a MakerBot. So that way, by always kind of keeping that as my kind of ruling strategy at the beginning, I was able to make it, make it so it worked. So people can download all the files to, to make this? Yes, the files for this are freely available on Thingiverse. Anybody can download it and build their own copy. That's great. That's really cool. I heard that there's a, a, a remote controlled car kit coming out soon. There is something in the works at the moment to actually make this car even easier to build and then allow some other things in the future. Uh, we're working on getting that into the MakerBot store, hopefully in the beginning of November. Cool. It's really exciting. Can I, let me see. I like I like to, I like to do I like what you said to wear it. Out. <laughs> that looks great. And I also like uh, right. Yeah. yeah uh -huh. um, and I like that the jo the joining pieces are the, these little spiky bits are like joined to the body with like more plastic filament, more of the. Here, it's just it pieces of three millimeter ABS filament that we clipped off of the spool. And they are like the joining the the joining bits. Maybe we'll put, put that, that under, under the, the under the camera. camera. Maybe we can get get a close up of. Yeah, so yeah, in here you can see. We have uh, just bits of three millimeter that have been pressed into the holes in order to make the connections. Cool. And it works really well. It's great. Can you talk about SketchUp a little bit? We were talking about it before. Maybe you could show of us course. something in SketchUp. I, I've, I've got some of my files open here in SketchUp. Cool. I have, uh, first we can see this is just the Thingiverse page for the That's Turtle Shell Racers. That's where people can download. Because you can download great. it. Mm -hmm. but, and we have uh, a link to your Thingiverse profile in the chat. So. Oh, lovely. Uh, first I'll pull up, this is an earlier object that I did at Cathedral. This just kind of gives you an idea of how you can build a module in SketchUp. So each piece of this cathedral is actually a separate group. If you've played uh. with SketchUp a little bit, you've probably noticed that things like to stick together. The way to get around that is to group things. So if I click on one of these objects and double click on it, it will open. And now we're just editing that one piece of the group. That's great, that's now, cool. Alternately, the same concept is what allows you to make really complicated things. So here, you know, avert your eyes if you don't like complexity. Oh, wow. <laughs> this is the design file for the turtle shell racer. I can't look away. <laughs> that now, is inside incredible. This, you'll see there's actually several different versions and experimentations of the racer in here. But really what's in the center is what ended up going into the car. So you can see the gearbox and you can see a lot of the other elements. 
once again, all of these elements are in their own group. So if we just want to pull out the gearbox element, I'll double click on it, and now we can see the gearbox both assembled and pulled apart. That is incredible. So, and SketchUp is free, right? The version of SketchUp that I'm using is the free version of SketchUp, and then you kind of expand upon the functionality by adding in free plugins. That's, inc that's incredible that you, you can do this with a, f a free piece of software. I would think that this would be like a $3,000 CAD program or something that would do something like this. Is it, is it make it then harder to, to do it because it's, it's to, a more basic tool? Or? What I like to say about SketchUp is you have to think about what you're going to do. It doesn't, it's not very forgiving if you go in and just want to play with a ball of clay. What's good about that is, for what we're doing in 3D printing, it actually forces you to think about the geometry you're making. So, say you wanted to make a gear. You go into a lot of other design packages and you just type in the numbers and your gear shows up. You have no idea how much geometry is inside that gear. There could be, you know, three megabytes worth of geometry in that one gear, mm -hmm. which will print just fine. But when you're trying to be efficient and you're trying to get something that's reproducible on as many machines as possible, you want to be very efficient with the data that you're producing. Right. And you, so you have some experience, I heard. You went to architecture school. What, yeah. did, what did you use there? I, I went through architecture school. Um, I'm proficient in both Maya, which is a more of an animation package, and 3D Max, which is I was using to do renderings in my previous life. Did that, did that, was, it help, was it a help or was it a hindrance for you when you went and ske into SketchUp and started? Um, I would, I'd say they were both very, very helpful. Um, essentially, when I was originally taught to use 3D, uh, my professor made a very big note about he was not teaching us to use a software package. Mm -hmm. He was teaching us the basic tools that any software package included and that you would find in any package you transitioned into. So when I got to SketchUp, I kind of knew what the basics were already, and that allowed me to kind of branch out from there very, very quickly. Cool, cool. Now, what about getting this design into the, to the printer. What's involved in, in, in that? To get this into the printer, Google SketchUp's free edition does not natively export, export an STL. It will if you have the, the paid edition. Wait, we, I don't think we've covered what, the, what an STL is yet. Like, uh -huh. what, what does it mean to have this solid object that you can print? Well, an STL file stands for, I believe, for a stereolithography file, but I'm not 100%. We're getting a nods in the audience here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. okay, no, we're no, good no, all the way around. Yeah, okay. yeah, it's uh, <laughs> technology that goes back a ways. Um, mm -hmm. But essentially, it's a very, very simple store of geometry. It uses everything, puts everything out as a triangulated face. An STL file is what Replicator G actually needs to feed the model into the printer. And that's the, uh, that STL file gets transformed through Skyforge, sliced and made into the G code that will later get fed into the MakerBot. Okay, so you have to have a cake before you can print it. You can't have a picture of a cake. That's what I always learned. I, like when we learned, <laughs> what? not what? a very good analogy. No, I use no, birthday, no, go, go, I go ahead, go ahead, Becky. Cakes for every, I use birthday cakes for the battery okay. analogy, whatever. <laughs> anyway, like uh, I always learned, like we learned maybe a little bit of Rhino 3D or something. That's that's just um, you, you just have like this idea of a plane, it's not really a solid object. And I okay. was taught that you had to close off all your shapes and there might be a hole somewhere and the MakerBot doesn't understand when there's well, a if hole. There, if there's a hole, if there's a leak in the stereolithography file, then the MakerBot will try to print infinitely out of that leak. And mm -hmm. that's something that you can control by making checking your geometry very closely. And there's also a few free tools that will go through your model mm -hmm. and attempt to close the holes. They don't always work. It's better to not create holes to begin with. Right, so you could start with something like Tinkercad or uh, really specifically made SketchUp files. Exactly. Cool. Oh, that's awesome. Great. Can you show us a little bit of Replicator G out here? Um, let me see. Let's see. Hold on, my background is very, very messy on this computer. Oh. <laughs> it's okay, we won't go So Replicator G is, is software that can, is specific for the MakerBot, is that? Replicator G is, it's not specific to the MakerBot, it's used by a lot of different okay. machines in the community. It is... But it was for 3D printing. Yes. Yeah, it's for controlling okay. 3D printers. Okay, got it. And it's come a long way from when I used it with my, my number 43 cupcake machine, where like Replicator G is just a code window, just like Arduino or processing, and now right. it's got this like interface, which is why I want you to show it, because I'm like, wait, that's Replicator G? No, it's got pictures now. God, it's got pictures <laughs> now. It's got pictures. It, that's big for me, I like pictures. So here is uh, just a, a differential that I was experimenting with, which was recently uploaded to Thingiverse. It's not my design. Unfortunately, I don't remember the designer's name. If you're out there, identify yourself, please. Um, 
But what we can see is we've got the model that's been loaded in its STL form into the window. And then we have these options. We can view it, which is what we're doing now. You can move it, rotate it, mirror it, and scale it. These kind of let you just make sure that it's OK on the build surface. This blue surface here is actually the build surface of the machine I've selected, which is, in this case, the thing I'm at. Once we're done, we'll hit this button down here to generate G-code. And what that brings up is actually a G-code generator, which will feed the model into Skyforge. We hit generate G-code, and then the computer will chug for a bit as the model gets sliced and made into G-code. So it slices it so that the, I mean, and we'll learn a little bit more about the hardware of the printer in a moment, um, but it needs to slice it so that it has layer information for printing out the well, layers of the Well, essentially, yes. Imagine, so we're going to draw this, but we can only draw one line at a time. So imagine, like, the world's coolest Etch-a-Sketch, but it can't, like, go back through each other. So you know you want to draw that image on the Etch-a-Sketch, but you can't go back through your old lines? So this is a piece of software that will actually decide the shape and figure out the order in which all the lines are drawn to make that shape for each layer. How cool. convenient. Yeah, great. Huh. Cool. We well, had a question you, you about, the, about modeling the, the turtle. Somebody suggested taking a sphere and like pushing holes in it. How did you make the design for the turtle shell? Did it start as a sphere? The turtle shell actually started as a series of just basic solids. The, um, the original shape is a sphere that was squashed and stretched to get what we were looking for in terms of proportions. And then I started transforming it, cutting away for the two different colors, adding the, the kind of rope cylinder lines for the, yeah, sorry, the different delineations. So if you look closely at it, you can still kind of see the original record of where it was. It was originally a sphere. And that's the basic solid that makes up this shape. That's incredible. For such a fun thing. They're so fun to drive around and they're so like, I don't know, I just love looking at them. The ones with the lights inside were really awesome. And We did have the, the nighttime version, which was uh, to illustrate PLA as a material. So it was printed with PLA. What's and PLA? PLA is a, a corn-based plastic that the MakerBots can also print with. Um, this particular shell had a gigantic cluster of RGB LEDs inside of it that lit the whole shell up at night. It was really nice. It was like a great. streak of multicolored lights yeah. shooting off into the distance. That's, so cool. That's great. Well, thank you for showing all of this to us. This well, is, thank you for having me.